This ceremony marked the end of an era. The crowd knew it. As they gathered at the Naval Air Station, they were in a sentimental, quiet, nostalgic mood. The guest of honor was retiring from naval aviation today. After more than 20 years of distinguished service, the old warrior of countless skies was being given a final tribute and a last farewell. But the honored guest today was not a fighting man of the United States Navy. It was an airplane, not an ordinary plane, but a magnificent aircraft that had served our nation in peace and war for a record-breaking two decades. The officers and men gathered here are saying goodbye to an old friend, the last Sky Raider in Navy service. The sturdy, prop-driven attack bomber, affectionately known as a SPAD, was about to be piped over for the flight to its final destination, the Naval Aviation Museum at Pensacola, Florida. Douglas Sky Raiders rewrote the history of close air support. They were the first aircraft ever to carry their own weight in bomb loads. They became one of the best known, most effective propeller-driven aircraft the world would ever see. For more years than any other plane in aviation history, they were the guts and the backbone of the United States Navy. Yet, this versatile eagle of naval aviation came within a whisker of not being born at all. The story of the Sky Raider began in our nation's capital in 1944. The Second Great War was coming to an end, closing the book on the most extensive campaign of all time by carrier-borne aircraft. Up to that time, the Douglas Dauntless, designated the SBD, had been and in fact still was the Navy's foremost attack aircraft. But the war in the Pacific had changed so much that the need for a new attack bomber was becoming evident. Three top Douglas engineers attended a meeting in Washington where they learned two things. First, all further modifications on the SBD were canceled. Second, they discovered two other companies had been asked to submit proposals for a new attack aircraft. The Douglas engineers went to their hotel and worked through the night on preliminary sketches of the new Sky Raider. The following morning was the deadline for any consideration. The sketches intrigued the Navy enough that Douglas was allowed to enter the competition and eventually was awarded the contract. In nine short months, the Sky Raider evolved from lines on a blueprint to a plane. Early in March 1945, the prototype was test flown. From the first moment, the Navy knew they had a winner. What they had no way of knowing at that time was that they had a champion. The Navy had been searching for a new dive bomber, attack aircraft, to meet the changing tactical and operational requirements. The Sky Raider gave them all that and much more. Within the span of the next 12 years, Douglas Aircraft Company was to manufacture 3,180 Sky Raiders in seven versions and 28 subversions. January 1948, the USS Coral Sea embarked on her maiden voyage. The first launch and recovery ever attempted from the flight deck of the newly christened carrier was accomplished by a Skyrim. 
was only fitting and proper for the Sky Raider to join the Coral Sea as she sailed for the first time. For, as fate would ordain some 20 years later, the same carrier and the very same squadron would witness the last combat cruise of the Never Say Die Sky Raiders. But before that day was to arrive, the Sky Raider proved to be the muscle in the Navy's air arm. She earned her nickname, the Pedigreed Pulverizer, as the Sky Raider served with distinction in two major wars. Striking with deadly payloads from the carrier USS Valley Forge, Sky Raiders blasted targets in Korea on July 3rd, 1950, just three days after the start of the United Nations action. From then on, hardly a day passed that Sky Raiders didn't strike. Since the Korean War, Sky Raider squadrons on board America's 15 attack carriers have been on the line ready to perform in every Cold War situation where naval power has been brought to bear. Lebanon, Suez, Matsu, Quemoy, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, and Vietnam. During this period, the old Sky Raider managed to stay on the varsity while five different types of jet attack aircraft have made the team, been benched, and eventually have had their numbers retired from the carrier aircraft inventory. The Sky Raider's longevity on the first team of strike aircraft is tacit acknowledgement of her outstanding performance over the years. Above all, the Sky Raider was versatile, equipped to perform four major missions, day attack, all-weather attack, airborne early warning and countermeasures. Some versions of the Sky Raiders could, however, through flight deck adaptation kits, convert into a VIP or high-density passenger aircraft, or an ambulance or cargo plane, or an anti-submarine search craft, a target tow, and even a tanker. In her primary role of attack aircraft, the spectrum of usable weapons ranges from torpedoes to rockets, to cannons, to bullets, to bombs, including nuclear weapons. A single Sky Raider is a half dozen airstrikes all by itself. The Sky Raider demonstrated that it was the first plane capable of carrying greater than its own structural weight in armament. The truest method of measuring any plane is to talk to the men who fly her. I'm Lieutenant J.G. Chuck Tome uh, from Aurora, Illinois. I'm Lieutenant J.G. Robert Hagen from Long Beach, California. Do you know, do you know what a SPAD is? This is a SPAD, A-1 Sky Raider. We call it the SPAD probably only because it's got the prop on the front and it's an old airplane. But that's a pilot's pet name for it. And it's uh, rather an antique in the, the days of the fast jets. So uh, consequently, we uh, wanted to dub the aircraft a certain uh, very distinctive name, and so we named it the SPAD. Oh, we really love them. I think uh, there, there isn't a SPAD pilot in the fleet that's not flying it that, that really wanted them. Like, in my case, I wanted them before I even came into the Navy, so I would have really been disappointed flying any other bird. Well, in the Korean War, the SPAD was used generally as a strike aircraft. In other words, if a, a group of uh, soldiers, Marines, are on the ground and they're in trouble, uh, there's a couple of ways that they can help themselves, either through artillery or, as, or air. And this is where the SPAD came in quite a bit in the Korean War, in the uh, mission of getting in there real close to the troops and dropping their, their bombs, shooting their guns, and firing their rockets. And uh, the, the ground troops really had a lot of confidence in the, in the, in the old SPAD because the, the plane was, is stable. It really is a stable platform for uh, ordnance delivery. And the pilots, of course, uh, were outstanding. And they could really get their ordnance on the target. However, the primary mission is the Rescue Combat Air Patrol, or RESCAP, which we do uh, escort helicopters into North Vietnam to uh, 
suppress ground fire while the uh, helicopter is in transit. Well, that's a pretty big morale factor for the pilots that go down over there, too, because uh, when they go down, they like to see the spads up above protecting them from uh, being captured, at least in long enough until the helo can get there. And a spad has got a lot of firepower, can stay there a long time, and protect them for a long time accurately until the uh, helo can come and pick them up. After more than 20 years, the huge old bird saw its last combat action in Vietnam. Just south of Hanoi, as a rest cap, after rendezvous, we will proceed as a division, rendezvous point, to the vicinity of the Hourglass River. Check in with the North SAR destroyer, pick up our he helicopters, at which time we'll split two sections. I'd like one section just south of the Red River mouth to pick up anybody coming out in trouble. From the time we cross the coast, I want to get the helo just as high as possible. There's no missile activity reported this far. There came that inevitable moment when it was the last battle and the last war for the Sky Raider. When that final battle was over, the proud old Navy fighting bird folded her wings and called it a day. She came home from Vietnam in style. Like most great planes, the Sky Raider was created out of need and necessity. But even her most ardent supporters in the 40s never dreamed the Spad would be around to celebrate her 20th operational birthday. Combat aircraft just don't stay around that long, very often. Yet, more than two decades have gone by since she sailed on the maiden voyage of the USS Coral Sea. Now the old Sky Raider was coming home from her final cruise with the same squadron and aboard the same carrier. that final moment was at hand. Bureau number 35300 taxied past the side boys. The crowd stood at attention. And the last Navy Sky Raider was formally piped over. memory of the Sky Raider will long be recalled and relived in the hearts and minds of the fighting men of the United States Navy. dusty roads of history, Navy men turned their faces to a clean wind, challenging the sea to adventure and discovery. In conquering the sea, they conquered themselves, making courage and excellence a proud tradition. Then they looked up from the decks of their ships and conquered the sky, bringing the Navy into the world of flight.
Naval aviators are a very special breed of men who have met the challenge of sea and sky. For in all the world, only a few have mastered the sky from the deck of a ship at sea. This is a classroom, the course Naval Aviation at Pensacola, Florida. So I'll tell you, you never uh, readjusted your attitude before you took that power off, so you just stayed slow the whole way. Okay. These students are practicing precision oh, landings. Meatball. Easy does it. Easy. Following a beam of light called the meatball, they aim for a 10-foot spot on the runway. As the LSO, or landing signal officer, their instructor talks them in on their approach and grades their performance. It is essential that they be proficient at these landings because soon, for the first time, the young pilots will land their planes aboard an aircraft carrier at sea. Watch the ball. I never flown. In a, I never even been in a small plane before, you know, except for the you know, big bus in the sky. That was about it. And uh, just amazes me when I think think back on it. You know that now I'm flying, actually flying a jet. And you get up there and you start thinking about what you used to think of as a kid, and there you are doing it. And it's really not something mystifying at all. I mean, it's something. Uh, it's not like driving a car, but it's. Yeah, it takes work. I think uh, when you're on the ground, you feel kind of trapped. You ever felt that way? And, and every time you look around, you see something man is built. But when you get upstairs, you go, hey, man, what he's built is real small compared to everything else. And it, and it gets smaller. So uh, I think sometimes, too, though, flying is, is a job, you know, like any other job. You get up there, and uh, there aren't regular hours to it. And like they say, flying is especially flying a jet, is nine-tenths boredom and one-tenth stark terror. Your mind kind of works like a computer. You plug all these things in. You really amaze yourself, because after a pass, you figure out, well, I was a little wide there, a little long in the groove. And uh, you figure out the corrections you make, and you plug them in. You know, it's like, I don't know anything about computers, but I assume that's what you do, you know. You plug in the very, you find out the variables, and what you need to make a good pass, you plug it in, you do it. Your mind works like a computer. It's amazing. And I'm sure most of us feel, or all of us feel, completely confident in it. There are a lot of things that we don't know about flying, 
but we no longer are scared by it, and we can just go out. This has been the first time I felt like I can just go out, hop on a bird, and feel completely comfortable, know what I'm doing every time. It could be something like an athlete trained for a race, couldn't it? He trains for weeks and weeks, maybe even months, all for one race, maybe even one a year at the most. And now tomorrow, that's that's our point. Maybe it'll only be 30 minutes worth of time, but like you said, during that time, you're going to be... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're just going to have to, I mean, getting out to the boat isn't something that, there's that point, like he says, where you come around before you pick up the ball, and it's all pretty much just like it's been in training. And then once you pick up the ball, you got it. They didn't always fly jets. Although college graduates, they, like all young men entering the service, were subjected to those first few weeks of becoming accustomed to the military environment. This course is too different an officer indoctrination course prepared the student aviators for basic flight training. It is here they prove they had what it takes. Motivation, willpower, stamina, and the sincere desire to fly. This was the beginning. The evolutionary process of becoming naval aviators is continued at Softly Field. The busyness of the ready room reflected the anticipation of early flights. The countless briefs and debriefs never became routine as each successive flight grew more demanding. Like an athlete before a game, the young pilots spent their pre-flight hours in mental preparation, memorizing procedures, and waiting. It was now time to solo, time to prove one's abilities to the instructor, but more importantly to oneself. It was during these early flights that the self-confidence was developed, which would prove so valuable throughout the young pilot's career. was the beginning. Now commissioned and flying jets, the students and their instructor get together at the club for an informal bowl session. It is a time to pay off pitchers of beer for poor practice landings, but also an opportunity to relate with a veteran carrier pilot. Let me, uh, that'd be kind of fun to see what you think of uh, carrier landings before and afterwards. So, uh, like Just let, let me know what, what some of your expectations are, you know, in going to meet the big steel hulk for the first time. <laughs> what do you think, Steve? What do you, what's it going to feel like to get a cat shot for the first time? I'm going to be sweating. I'm going to be sweating the most as I roll over the shuttle, I think. You know. I'm going to really be sweating. And then, like you said, I think it's going to be an eternity between the time he, uh, he gives the go and, the, and that thing really fires. I think once uh, I think once I get in the air, I'm going to be too preoccupied with procedures. Do you ever get kind of a tug on the wire, and then all of a sudden it lets loose? Uh, only if you grab a wire and then uh, then the hook releases it. It's for example, you can 
the hook is right here. And if you caught the wire just on the on the middle part of it without getting underneath, it could pull the wire out and then have the hook slip off. And so that's that's the reason for the procedure of going 100% as soon as you feel an impact and staying there with a the full power on the aircraft until you know that you're going to stop. But you're dealing in exceptions. You can't afford not to expect the exception to the rule. And that's the big, yeah, that's the big ticket. It's just like in, in any procedure, you're learning the procedure for the exception, not for the norm. Although you have not much control over it, things are going to happen real quick and it's going to shake your brains a little bit. The young pilots set out on their final practice landing session. Their performance now would determine whether they would fly to the carrier the next day. Okay, Steve, had a pretty good period. You're still, I got two, two passes, you're still uh, a little late with your nose. Same as last time. First one was an okay fast start. Next one was a overshoot, a little not enough power and close, and ended up a little fast high at the ramp. And the next one was fair, just a little fast all the way again, and a little late nose. And one thing that complicates it is the fact that you're flying a little fast, so it's harder to make a nose correction. And then Lee, <coughs> so he's going to be bouldering at the ship. Wave off, fast start, low at the ramp. And a fair pass, not enough straightaway, a little not enough power and close, and a little rough nose again. And then an okay pass, I can't remember what the start was like, but just at the last there, you, one of these nose jobs again, where you pick your nose up and just a little over the top right of the ramp, just enough to change from a three to a four wire. You're in good shape until you goof with that I'm nose. I'm going to see that uh, ball starting to fall or something. I'm trying to stop it. <clears throat> well, stop it with a, a little less. You're just over controlling is what it amounts to. You're just moving it more than it needs to be moved. So everybody's feel qualified and ready to go to the ship. It's a piece of cake if you're smooth. stood ready as the sun burned off the early morning fog. Sixty miles out in the Gulf, the carrier steamed toward the rendezvous. It would soon be time to go. Yeah. But everybody's got to watch it. 
Jim, I think you watched by nine o'clock. Yeah, pretty close to it. How is my synchronizer watch out? So are your gun birds? We all agree. Right now, baby. I can see it right now. Yeah, let's go. The flight to the carrier would be the longest 60 miles the students had ever flown. Although they'd simulated scores of carrier landings before, there was something very different about this flight, something that could not be simulated in any training situation. The runway would now be only 500 feet long, moving through the water at 25 knots and subject to the rolling and pitching motions of the sea. This was the real thing and it was a flight that had been thought about many times before. This is the tenseness of hitting the boat. The, the unknown, the, uh, the variables that you haven't encountered before. The apprehension that you have is just sort of a, uh, a nebulous sort of a thing that you really don't put any, any actions to. It's just a tenseness, an awareness that this is something new and different, something that might not work just like everything else you've done. But no, you don't, you don't think about, there's no fear. You're too busy. To get the feel of the deck, the first time would be a touch-and-go landing without the tail hook. Okay. Roger, three, four, 
number two wire. Not bad for the first time. Landing completed, they would now move forward to their first launch from a steam catapult, which would literally throw them back in the air and into a series of landings that would soon become routine. I didn't go deep. I got a run of on you before you died. Well, I wanted it. I had three boulders. I thought I had a run. I heard somebody laughing, you you put and all of a sudden it dawned on me. Before they could say, hey, the hook's not down, ha ha, you know. I heard my hook, and I faltered it anyway. <laughs> I mean, our plan is to land it with half flat, so we want to serve a debrief for someone like that here. You're not going to change tonight, are you, Dave? Negative. All right. <laughs> We're all back, and happy it's over with. I'm sure you learned something out there. This is uh, this is what it's all about. And like you say, it is fast. Things happen very quickly out there, but as time passes, you will uh, get better and better and better at it. So the young pilots would have six more months of training before they received their Navy wings. But to them, this was the day they became naval aviators.
tonight and tomorrow, the operation will be repeated as naval aviation guards America's sea frontier. It is here on the flight deck, in the busy hangars and shops, in the ready room, and in the darkness of CIC, that 50 years of history have made their mark. A half century of progress, experiment, and vision. A story that has not yet had its final chapter. Just seven years after the Wright's flight at Kitty Hawk, far-sighted Navy strategists assigned Captain Washington Irving Chambers the job of observing and reporting on aviation developments of particular concern to the Navy. In November 1910, Eugene Ely, civilian pilot, successfully flew his Curtis-built plane off the deck of the cruiser Birmingham. In another demonstration a few months later, Ely used a crude arresting gear of cables and sandbags to land on the cruiser Pennsylvania. Doubters were convinced. An appropriation of $25,000 in 1911 procured for the Navy its first land plane and two sea planes like this one. Three planes and one aviator, Lieutenant T.G. Ellison, trained by Glenn Curtis. The first aviation training camp was established at Annapolis in 1911. A very small group of officer students, including the first marine aviator, Lieutenant A.A. A. Cunningham, began to study the problems of flight. Catapult experiments from barges and later from ships were begun in 1912. Seaplane operations had developed to the point where seaplane units could take part in the Mexican intervention of 1914. At Vera Cruz, a plane piloted by Lieutenant, later Admiral Bellinger, was fired upon. The first Navy plane damaged in combat. World War I gave naval aviation a chance to show what it had learned during its short existence. Nearly 3,000 planes were built by Curtis, Martin, Boeing and others. Thousands of pilots and observers were trained to utilize the Navy's new weapon. Haste was essential. German U-boats were threatening our supply lines and periling the Allied effort. The Naval Aviation Unit, commanded by Lieutenant Kenneth Whiting, was one of the first American groups to reach Europe. From coast bases in England, Italy and France, Flyers took off on U-boat patrols and raided German submarine pens on the North Sea. The Davis non-recoiling rifle was developed as an anti-submarine weapon. Naval aircraft designers had learned much from early wartime experiences. Their combined design talents produced the NC patrol planes, a joint effort of Curtis and Navy. These were completed too late to see action, however, but a greater future was planned for them. Under Commander John Towers, three of the NCs left New York in May 1919 to attempt a transatlantic flight to Portugal via Newfoundland and the Azores. Only the NC-4 made it all the way. The NC-4 skipper, Lieutenant Commander Albert Reed and his crew were given a dignified welcome in England and a noisy one in New York. Now came the 1920s, a period of rapid development in aircraft and flight operations. Established to conduct the expanding program of naval air, the Bureau of Aeronautics under its first chief, Rear Admiral William Moffat, began to shape the destiny of aviation in naval planning. Main purpose? to send planes to sea on ships. First, turrets of capital ships were rigged to launch aircraft. The equipment was not always dependable. To take the risk out of such launchings, catapults were strengthened so that cruisers and battleships could carry their own aerial scouts. Successful takeoffs sent mines leaping ahead to the next logical step. Ships that could carry many planes, floating airfields, 
to provide the concentration of force necessary for effective sea air attack. The time for the aircraft carrier was near. But exhaustive tests with arresting gear had first to be conducted on land to find some way of stopping a fast plane from crashing into parked aircraft. By 1922, arresting gear was available that could do the job, and it was installed on the Navy's first carrier, a decked over old collier christened the USS Langley. Lieutenant Godfrey Chevalier, one of Naval Aviation's pioneers, made the Navy's first carrier landing in an Aero Marine. There was still much to learn about deck operations. But nothing discouraged the determined aviators. They kept trying. This was a new problem, demanding the utmost in skill and precision. These pioneers risked their lives to gain experience, to test new ideas, and perfect new techniques. Eventually, their courage and determination paid off. Carrier operations became routine, a model of speed and efficiency. And the Navy had a new weapon to use with the big guns of the battle fleet. Meanwhile, designers were working with the first wind tunnel models create aircraft specially adapted to the Navy's needs. One of these new plane types, the Helldiver, became world famous for dive bombing accuracy. Marine and Navy interest in this precise form of bombing paid off in a big way when war came. Precision bombing of land and sea objectives was an art, one that had been perfected by years of practice and teamwork. The Washington Disarmament Conference of 1922 forced us to scrap plans for two half-built battle cruisers, but allowed them to be converted and completed as aircraft carriers. The Secretary of the Navy demonstrated how landings and takeoffs were to be made from their decks much longer and wider than the Langley's. These two carriers were christened Saratoga and Lexington, beginning the tradition of naming aircraft carriers for great battles. Both participated in the war games of the late 20s. These exercises confirmed beliefs that carrier-based and operated aircraft would open a new era of sea air power. The Saratoga and the Lexington were joined by others in the 30s, the Ranger, Yorktown, Enterprise, Hornet, and Wasp, forerunners of a mighty armada soon to come. In 1925, Commander John Rogers on the right and a crew of four men left San Francisco in the first attempt to fly to Hawaii. The PN-9, their metal-hulled flying boat, set a world's distance record of 1,800 miles before being forced down at sea. Rigging a wing as a sail, Commander Rogers proved himself a seaman as well as an airman, sailing the PN-9 the remaining 450 miles to Hawaii. The constant effort to build long-range capabilities into naval patrol aircraft resulted in improved flying boat design. What the Navy learned about the great Catalina was passed on to civilian airlines, aiding the inauguration of scheduled trans-Pacific flights in 1936. The highly accurate Norden bomb site was developed under Navy auspices and became the standard site for U.S. horizontal bombing aircraft. The bulky undercarriage of the earlier fighters 
was eventually replaced by retractable landing gear, decreasing drag and increasing speed. The old biplane gave way to the monoplane, and speeds jumped again. All the developments since the First World War, the long-range flying boat, the dive bomber and the torpedo plane, the concept of a mobile task force, the development of tough and powerful fighters, and above all, the superb training of pilots and crewmen were soon called to meet the greatest challenge our Navy had yet faced. Japanese carrier aircraft struck. When the smoke had cleared and losses were evaluated, our Pacific fleet was temporarily out of action. Gloom settled thickly over the country. But the Navy's top strategist thanked God that all our carriers were at sea December 7th. And though few in number, were ready to launch their planes in counterattack. Now naval aviation would be given an opportunity to justify the years of its development, the training of thousands of men, the time and money and sweat expended on it. Airmen turned grimly to the task before them. The carriers of the Pacific Fleet launched a series of raids on the Japanese-held islands, the Marshalls, Wake, and the Gilbert. In May 1942, they found and stopped the enemy in the Coral Sea. The Japanese were forced to turn back from their goal, Australia. Despite losses, naval air won its first strategic victory, and followed it a month later by battering the enemy at Midway. This was the turning point of the Pacific War. The enemy was stalled. Hawaii and the United States were spared attack. Atlantic, the Navy was fighting another enemy, one it had battled before, the German U-boat. Hundreds of Allied merchant ships went to the bottom before the U.S. could organize its defenses. Navy patrol planes joined forces with surface units to range the Atlantic from Iceland to Rio. Back and forth across the Caribbean, too, searching, searching, searching for the telltale periscope, for the foaming wake, for the shadowy reflection of a submarine just below the surface. Blimps joined the hunt as convoy escorts. But all this was not enough. The mid-ocean areas could not be covered by land-based search planes. The Navy's answer was the escort carrier, born of necessity. These hastily built baby flat tops joined the fleet in 1943. And with their planes teamed with destroyers, eventually swept the German U-boats from the Atlantic. The capture and boarding of the U-505 by a jeep carrier and destroyer hunter-killer group climaxed the Navy's action in the Atlantic. At war's end, naval air power had accounted for 99 enemy submarines. In the Pacific, meanwhile, our offensive was underway. Guadalcanal saw heroic holding action by Navy and Marine airmen flying from Henderson Field. The offensive gained momentum with new fighters like the Hellcat and the Corsair, torpedo bombers like the Avenger. Rockets gave a mighty wallop to our Navy planes. Radar came to our aid too, on shipboard, in planes, and in anti-submarine operations. No longer could the enemy attack us in darkness or in fog. The all-seeing eye of radar would find him, plot his course, and guide our planes in for the kill. The pattern of the Pacific War 
emerged as one of island hopping across the reaches of the once tranquil ocean. Army and Marine invasion forces relied on naval air to soften up enemy defenses. Assault leaders spotted enemy emplacements, called for air support to wipe them out. Men in the combat information centers aboard ship plotted quickly, carefully. American lives hung in the balance, waiting for help from the floating airfield. Fighters swept over the beaches, sought the enemy hidden in his bunkers, blasted, strafed, burned until the islands were secure. In the Battle of the Philippine Sea in 1944, now remembered as the Marianas Turkey Shoot, naval air scored its greatest triumph over Japanese carrier aircraft. Navy gunners on ship and in the air and in the space of one day, shot down 400 attacking enemy planes. Japanese naval air was crushed. Its funeral was held at Lady Gulf. Japan fought back with land-based suicide planes, but it was too late. She had been defeated on land, on sea, and most decisively in the air over the sea. Naval aviation had led the way across the Pacific, the Coral Sea, Midway, the Solomons, the Marshalls, the Marianas, the Philippines, finally Okinawa, and the Japanese home island. 1945 saw a victory in the Pacific. It was a tribute to the faith and courage of naval aviation pioneers whose 30-year struggle made this weapon the sinews and muscle of sea power. Naval aviation had established its value in World War II, but the struggle to prove itself was not over. Astonishing technological developments at the eve of victory posed vast perplexing problems for naval aviation and critics saw in them the doom of the carrier task force. The nuclear weapon. How would the light carrier plane ever be able to employ it effectively, the critics asked. How could the task force survive the devastation of atomic attack? the new high-performance jet plane ever be adapted to operate from the relatively short carrier deck? These were serious problems that threatened the future of the carrier as an important element in our military security. And the history of naval aviation since World War II is largely the story of the solution of these problems. The last half of the 1940s were busy, fruitful years for the naval air arm, as it engaged in many far-flung activities. Its aircraft mapped 5,500 miles of the Antarctica coastline. The Navy also displayed its new long-ranged reconnaissance capability when its P-2V truculent turtle made a record-shattering non-stop 11,000-mile flight from Australia to Columbus, Ohio, without refueling. A record that still stands today. At sea, the first rocket experiments began. Over the California desert, the Navy's sky streak plane pierced the upper atmosphere at supersonic speeds. At naval air stations, the first jet planes were being readied for employment on carriers. The FH Phantom, followed by F2H Banshees and F9F Panthers, operating from Essex class carriers, which now incorporated improved catapults to supplement the low initial power of the jets and improved arresting gear 
to absorb the impact of 130 mile per hour landing speed. The Korean action found naval aviation midway in its transition from World War II to a modern weapon system. Aided by reserves of men and planes, naval air was ready to strike back the moment the Korean War started. Navy and Marine airmen flew round the clock strikes to cripple the enemy's communications and transport. Close air support of the troops at the front became a specialty. The concept of carrier aviation, devised so long ago by the pioneers, once again proved a powerful force. Because of the carrier's mobility, naval air was able to attack anywhere on the Korean Peninsula. Ship and shore-based helicopters transported men and material in assault support, evacuated wounded to hospital ships, and rescued Americans trapped behind enemy lines. The pace of progress in technology quickened at the close of the Korean War. The Forrestal, the giant modern attack carrier, the dream of the late Admiral Mark Mitcher, became a reality. In it was the solution to many of the nagging problems that the post-war Navy had faced. Its armored decks were reinforced to handle multi-engined aircraft. Its steam catapults can thrust a 35-ton bomber into the air with ease. The angled deck solved the problem of swift, simultaneous launching and recovery of aircraft. The mirror landing system, coupled with precision carrier control approach techniques, ensured rapid, safe recovery. The construction of Forrestal and its sister ships was paralleled in progress in anti-submarine warfare, with the application of naval aviation becoming increasingly important. The hunter-killer team concept integrates surface ships with carrier-based aircraft, seaplanes, and land-based patrol planes. All of these aircraft incorporate advanced electronic systems for detecting and locating submarines and use a variety of weapons for making the kill. It was also the Navy which provided for the extension of our northern dew-line air defense system. Navy Warning Star radar planes now patrol the ocean flanks of the continent from Hawaii to the Aleutians, from Newfoundland to the Azores, maintaining constant electronic surveillance of these avenues of attack. The helicopter, not even a dream 50 years ago, has assumed an important role in naval aviation. As well as performing utility duty with the fleet, Giant passenger cargo copters are based aboard new vertical assault carriers. These carriers are designed to accommodate 2,000 fully equipped Marines. With this new means of amphibious assault, combat troops can be quickly put ashore, bypassing enemy shore defenses. So, 50 years after the Navy's first attempts at becoming airborne, naval aviation is a vital, indispensable force to maintain our security. carrier task forces that roam the major ocean areas of the world are ready for immediate action. Their effectiveness in bringing power to bear in critical areas has been demonstrated in the past. 
Lebanon and Formosa, for example. The typical task force is an elusive weapon dispersed over 50,000 square miles of water, guarded by supersonic crusader and F-4H phantom fighters, armed with deadly sidewinder and Sparrow III missiles. All its attack planes can employ either conventional or nuclear weapons. The A-3D, heavier than the Flying Fortress, is designed for long-range, high-altitude missions. While the Navy's smallest attack airplane, the A-4D, is designed to carry big weapons at low altitude. As the new 1,800-mile-per-hour vigilante bomber makes qualification trials aboard a carrier in the Atlantic, As the Enterprise, the largest ship in the world and the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, fits out for its first cruise, we have ample evidence that naval aviation is meeting the challenge of the future.